The idea of running long distance was always considered, you know, very questionable for women because, you know, an arduous activity would, would mean that you're going to get big legs and grow a mustache and hair on your chest and your uterus was going to fall out. That's Catherine Twitter, the first woman to officially run the Boston Marathon in 1967, defying the social norms of her time. Although she wasn't technically the first woman to finish the race, with Bobby Gibb getting that title in 1966, Switzer met more opposition due to her getting an official bib number. Because of her experiences, Switzer took a stand against the belief at the time about women running long distance by becoming an example to advocate for equality in the sport and creating organizations to support women's long distance running around the world. The Boston Marathon is possibly the most famous competitive marathon in the world, except for the Olympics. Debuting in 1897, the Boston Marathon's original distance was 24.5 miles. It was lengthened to the new standardized 26 miles 385 yards in 1925. Although women were not technically prohibited from entering the race, Boston rejected the majority of women that registered before the 1970s. The year 1970 was a milestone for the Boston Marathon because qualifying standards were introduced. After these new rules were put in place, the marathon's popularity boomed and runners from around the world came to race in its highly competitive setting. However, there was one other factor that boosted the popularity of the Boston Marathon, and much of it was due to a woman named Katherine Switzer. At 12 years old, Katherine Switzer wanted to make the field hockey team at her high school, so her father suggested running one mile a day to prepare for tryouts. When I ran this mile a day, I not only made the field hockey team, but I became so empowered. She knew that distance running was considered taboo for girls, but she also knew that she felt powerful as a result. This early step against societal norms in the 1950s and 60s sparked her lifelong interest in running. As she aged, the Boston Marathon intrigued her since, unlike the Olympics, it was supposedly open to anyone who wanted to try to run, and she was thrilled by the idea of running a marathon with some of the greatest runners in the world, which no other race offered. Arnie Briggs, the coach of Syracuse University boys cross country team, became Switzer's coach during her college career. There, she began training for the Boston Marathon, inspired by both Bobby Gibbs' unofficial finish in 1966 and Briggs' 15 times running it. Briggs originally doubted Switzer's ability, but agreed to let her register for the Boston Marathon if she could run the distance during practice. At this point, she's not concerned with the bigger picture of women's running or the effect her race would have, just her personal gain from the race. During one practice, Switzer ran 31 miles, significantly further than the 26.2 of the Boston Marathon. True to his word, Briggs helped Switzer register. So I paid my $2, I signed my name with my initials, and the entry form obviously went into Boston, and the Boston officials thought it was a guy, and they awarded me number 261. Wednesday, April 19th, 1967 was the day of the marathon, and it was 34 degrees and snowing. Switzer, Briggs, and Switzer's boyfriend, Tom Miller, lined up at the starting line. Switzer wore a gray sweatsuit for warmth. The men around her could tell her true identity, but didn't care. The race began with no problems. At the two-mile mark, a press truck was following Switzer's group, reveling over the fact that there was a woman racing with a bib number. And suddenly I saw this man, he was ferocious looking. And I was so frightened. He grabbed me by the shoulders and he spun me back like that and tried to rip off my bib number. And he screamed, get the hell out of my race and give me those numbers. I was so terrified and scared. But my boyfriend came running and hit the official and sent him flying out of the race. The man had been Jock Semple, the race manager, and the press truck had captured the whole encounter. The journalists got very aggressive. What are you trying to prove? You know, are you a suffragette? Are you a crusader? Whatever that is, you know? And I said, what? I'm just trying to run. But just wanting to run was exactly the root of the issue. As she would later say, it was very bad timing for the official, but it was very good timing for women's rights. Switzer met no further opposition in the race, but by now she had realized that she was running for more than just herself. At Heartbreak Hill, it struck her. I turned to my coach and I said, I have to finish the race, even if I have to finish it on my hands and my knees, because if I don't finish the race, nobody's going to believe that women can do this, nobody's going to believe that women should be here. Although she had entered initially on a whim, her treatment during the race proved to Switzer that she was running for a bigger cause. She realized that Bobby Gibbs' finish alone wouldn't solve the problem, nor would her struggle. Switzer became both radicalized and inspired by the incident with the official to create opportunities for other women in running. When she finished, she felt like she had a life plan. Switzer finished with a time of 4 hours and 20 minutes, not the fastest, but her mental and physical stamina after enduring the harassment still rendered her marathon monumental. 
These photos publicized afterwards made the world aware of the feminist struggle preventing women from registering for the race. Because of this and Switzer's officiation, this marathon received more press than Bobby Gibbs had the previous year. As a result, Switzer began to construct an organized plan to demonstrate women's capability in marathons, centered around the belief that this capability was universal. However, women were still not officially allowed into the Boston Marathon until 1972, so no immediate demands for running equality were met. Also, after the marathon, the official that had attacked Switzer had her disqualified from the race, then expelled from the Amateur Athletic Union for a whole list of reasons, one of which was running with men. Switzer also received hate mail and malicious press, but this was overshadowed by the amount of support she gained from young women and the running community as a whole. In 1970, five women ran the Boston Marathon, three ran the next year. In 1972, women were finally allowed to run the race officially, and a total of eight women ran and finished that year. In addition, Catherine Switzer's plan to organize women's marathons developed into the Avon International Running Circuit. We wound up organizing 400 races in 27 countries and used the data and statistics from those events to lobby the International Olympic Committee and got the women's marathon into the Olympic Games in 1984. She further helped by supporting medical research that showed it was safe for men and women to run marathons. Also, in the spirit of her race number, Switzer established a nonprofit organization called 261 Fearless. According to her website, it uses running to empower and unite women globally through many networking opportunities. It breaks down barriers between people and creates a healthy, fearless lifestyle for women. Overall, Switzer has made many worldwide contributions to the women's running community. To summarize, after Catherine Switzer started running in preparation for tryouts for a youth field hockey team, she began to run longer distances because of how it empowered her. She also ran to prove to her coach, Arnie Briggs, that she could run as far as any man, and was further inspired by Bobby Gibbs' marathon finish in 1966. After accidentally being mistaken for a man when registering for the Boston Marathon, Catherine Twitter got a number and began the race smoothly. But around the two-mile mark, she was attacked by a race official, Jock Semple, until her boyfriend took him out, allowing her to finish the race. This opposition made Twitter realize that she was running for women's equality, not just for herself. She left the race with a life plan to continue running and stand up for female athletes all over the world. As more women were inspired by Switzer and the officials received data proving their capabilities, the Boston Marathon granted women the official right to run in 1972. Switzer then successfully publicized women's long distance running globally through her Avon International Running Circuit events, eventually convincing the Olympics to add the women's marathon as an event in 1984. She also created 261 Fearless, a program that promotes healthy lifestyles for women. Because of Switzer's stands against societal bias, women became more widely accepted as equals in the running world. Although Bobby Gibb had finished the Boston Marathon a year before, Catherine Switzer made more of an impact. Gibb ran unregistered, disguised herself as a man, and hid before the race. Contrarily, Switzer did not disguise herself and ran with an official bib number. Switzer being attacked by the race official also drew more publicity due to the press photos of the incident, making the injustice more visible. Switzer took a stand against this inequality by unifying women's distance running globally and promoting it through multiple programs. She has written books as well, such as an autobiography entitled Marathon Woman. Meanwhile, Gibb has only written memoirs about her experiences. While Gibb was the jumping point, Switzer vaulted off the springboard and used her publicity and success for a higher feminist purpose. Catherine Switzer stood up for women's equality in sports by successfully registering for and running a previously all-male marathon, and by taking the brunt of attacks by race officials, as well as her society's sexism. Before Gibb, no woman had ever finished the marathon, but before Switzer, no woman had ever advocated so passionately about creating equality for female distance runners. Using her publicity for good, Switzer has made great fans in women's long-distance competition and the social beliefs around it. Switzer's contribution to the running world has greatly impacted society today. Her organizations expressed her message on a global scale, not just within the U.S. While we may take for granted today that men and women can compete in many of the same sports, Without Switzer's influence, track and field, cross country, and others may not be as equal. Her influence was a huge factor of the monumental Title IX to the Constitution in 1972, which finally allowed equal opportunities for male and female students in sports. We know if we can empower women, they can do anything. And it's sometimes the simplest thing, putting one foot in front of the other, will do that. By taking a stand against society's views during and after her race, Switzer has made great bounds toward equality in running. Her message is clear. Perseverance is key.